Welcome everyone to today's webinar. Um, I am Dora Jella and I'm here with my colleague Massimo Costantini and today we are welcoming Bettine Frieserkop from the Netherlands. Um, a very accomplished former player, coach and writer. Um, before I go over to a proper introduction, let me just quickly remind you all of our webinar code for the question and answers. Uh, there is a question and answer section, so if you have any questions for our guest, please just leave them there and we will get to them um, at the end of our webinar in the question and answer section. Thank you very much. Uh, and now over to the introduction of Bettine. Hi, Bettine. Very nice to have you here. Hello, Dora. Hello, Massimo. Thank you for having me. Nice to see you. And, um... Nice to see you too. And yes. thank you very much for being here. Um, you are a two times European champion in women's singles in 1982 and 1992, two times Europe top 12 winner in women's singles in 1982 and 1985, a quarter finalist in women's singles at the Olympic Games in Seoul in 1988, a winner of 12 international open tournaments. And besides all of that, you've also published a bunch of books, <laughs> which we will also be talking about today. Uh, so welcome, Bettine. Um, very nice to have you here. Thank you. Um, so this week marks 50 years of the start of ping pong diplomacy, which was, as we all know, uh, a bit of an opening of relations between the US and China after uh, a bit of a cooling period. <laughs> so, and since you have written quite extensively uh, about China, I think you are the perfect guest for this week. Um, and maybe if you could go ahead and introduce yourself a bit to us, a bit about your table tennis background, a bit about your writing background, that would be great. Okay, thank you, I will try, I'll try my best. Um, well, I was uh, starting uh, playing uh, table tennis when I was 11 in a small village uh, called Hazeswoude near Leiden, which is a university city. And um, um, uh, soon it was uh, recognized that I was quite talented. And uh, of course, back then in Holland, it was not that difficult to, you know, to, uh, to enter the top and especially not in juniors. So uh, in one year I was in the best in juniors and I went to European Youth Championships. And um, in a few years I was uh, able to be in, in the European uh, top. And back then it was like uh, when you were in the European uh, juniors top, then you were uh, uh, easily uh, able to catch up with uh, the senior uh, top. So in this, uh, when I was 16, I was already able to play at the top 12 for senior women, and uh, already when I was 16, I was ended up in, in second place, and which was quite achievable, and it was also quite surprising. And uh, then I continued, and it lasted for uh, five years before I could um, could be really at the top. Uh, that I was number one in the top 12, so that took me about four or five years after ending up twice in the second place, which I. I uh, repeated uh, for another three times, so I was five times runner-up in top 12. And so I continued to develop myself, and uh, when I was uh, finished, uh, you know, to, to learn in Europe, my dream was to go to China, and that was really, you know, uh, quite uh, astonishing, and it was a culture shock to, to, uh, to enter China, uh, actually quite, uh, quite uh, after the, the Cultural Revolution was ended. Uh, Mao Zedong, I believe he died in 1976, and so China was, you know, quite um, closed uh, back then when I was uh, entering in 1980, and people didn't, um, yeah, they were not used to uh, to receive foreigners, so I was received with a lot of, you know, gazing, you know, people were gazing at me at the street, and they were you know, touching my hair, if I was really real, you know. <laughs> and so, so this was, uh, uh, for me, it was like I was uh, struck by China. I was really fascinated from the beginning on. And I was also scared, you know. So, But I made a choice not to be scared, not to remain scared, but to, you know, to be fascinated by it. And I was also very uh, fond of the language, um, the beauty of the language, the, the speaking language, but also the characters, the writing. So I thought by myself, well, maybe if I end, uh, end, end up with my career, I want to study Chinese, which I did. 
So uh, that's what I did. And in my 30s, I went to the university to study Chinese. And in the meantime, I uh, was writing a book about my courses. Um, and so I combined table tennis, career, writing, uh, and the writing was always about China and uh, more or less about table tennis. So it's always has been a triangle, table tennis, writing, and uh, China. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, Massimo, <laughs> I think. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. I'm uh, uh, alive and kicking. Uh, Bettine, thank you so much uh, for being with us. Bettine is is a is a legend. I mean, it, uh, it's I don't know from the other side of the of the the screen, the attendees, but we are talking really with a great woman that made uh, unbelievable great results in uh, table tennis and having a, a very a nice career and she keeps uh, having a nice career as a writer and maybe also as a coach uh, we will touch later on uh, this aspect yeah. but my, my question was uh, uh, to let's start from the tt career but you already said everything but one thing i want to ask you when when did you uh, feel that uh, um, okay my career is uh, is uh, is uh, is to be a table tennis player was because uh, winning early, um, being the top of the ranking. Uh, what was the, the, the sparkle that uh, made you boom there in table tennis? Well, uh, you know, um, when I was 14 years, I was already like Dutch champion in seniors. And this was quite remarkable. And, um, you know, this was motivating me a lot, you know, that I was really uh, a talent and a, a prodigy and a, a revelation in table tennis. And that motivates you. And, you know, you have to get rewards when you work hard. And I always uh, got this reward, you know, they were sending to me the rewards. So I keep on, you know, I kept on training and I was, you know, of course, after 20 years and I went, I saw that I am not able to improve my game although I was practicing still hard, then I had difficult moments. But if you work hard and always the result is there, then it's very easy, you know? So I understand when players don't get the result, then the coach must be really able to motivate, to still motivate and say, no, it's not enough for three years, try four years. Maybe then then in one time you make a big jump. Because for, for instance, in, when I was 12, I was competing at the European Youth Championships already at the cadets level. And then I was not good. I was ending at, you know, last place, first round, I was out. Um, and then uh, second year cadet, also no result. Uh, and then uh, suddenly when I was first year junior, I made a real big leap and I became first year junior European Youth Champion. And I thought, wow, uh, you know, uh, everything, the, all the work, you know, has been rewarded now. So, uh, you know, it's good what I do. So I have to continue li like this. So and your, I, the and your, a little bit patience, but the reward cannot, you know, wait too long, I think. You have yeah, to see. Your, your, your work was very well rewarded. I mean, when I mean, we, we met many times around the, the, the competition, Europeans and uh, we we I personally admired you the attitude on the table. Uh, uh, Bettina was the, the most focused player. I I never seen her uh, you know distracting by something unbelievable focus on the ball, the winning, and uh, that was you are really a role model for uh, for a lot of a uh, lot of people. Myself also, so I have but to say. But you know, uh, uh, you are a legend in Italy, and I saw you, and you were always you know cheerful. You were always happy, and when when I met you, you always smiled, and you were. That was for me also nice, you know, because <laughs> you know, yeah, somebody who's like giving me a good uh, mood, you know, that's also important. Because sometimes I was too focused, so that's also not good. I I don't. I if I pre uh, train uh, my my no. my students now, my players, I say there must be a balance. Balance. For me, yes. too much. Balance. Yeah. So uh, uh, after finishing the, the TT career, you said that you were attracted by China, but you were, were you also attracted by 
coaching. I mean, China at that time also represented, uh, you know, a um, strong country. It was uh, stronger and stronger. So being there for uh, many years uh, um, was also the opportunity to think, uh, okay, I will now I want to go for a very uh, coach career, very good table tennis career and the coaching career. How, how this, uh, this happened? Did you consider to... To have, uh, you know, to be the top on the top, uh, being a coach. You know, you just mentioned I was so focused, and I think I asked too much from myself. You know, to be able to jump into the co into a coaching career after, you know, spending so so uh, many hours in the in the in the practice hall every day, and uh, you know, like uh, like the Chinese way. So to say, you know, no distraction, no, no going to, to parties or move to the movies or whatever. Only six hours, sometimes seven hours and only living for table tennis. When I was in the hall, I always left the hall when I finished my games. I never made fun or whatever. So I was quite uh, worn out, you know. I was a little bit having a burnout from table tennis and I wanted also to develop other skills in myself, you know. I thought, well, I intellectually or in many ways you can develop, but I only did one way. And I think um, it's really important also, like it's, uh, it benefits also your table tennis career when you also uh, develop some, some other skills in yourself, social skills, uh, intellectual skills, maybe creative skills. You know, it's, it, um, it adds up with your personality. Uh, which makes you stronger, and I think China has already um, regarded this. They 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 see that that this is uh, very important because when I was there and there was this pyramid system in China, you know, this provincial, this special yeah. sports schools, and this this pyramid, you go to the top, and uh, it didn't matter if they were ha unhappy, you, if they they you know they didn't make it at the top that they, they just you know choose other players you know to be to be uh, in the national team and um, sooner and now in the 90s and um, also I wrote as a journalist some articles when I was living in Beijing then the sports authorities also said we have we must regard the players not only as table tennis players but as happy human beings because if you are happy you play much better I think this is wow. real, real important yeah. You, you said so many so many interesting things uh, and uh, uh, back to the, the your experience the first experience in China I have to also to to remind my experience in China in '79 we were li really uh, like aliens you know like a stranger I mean oh look at that the, the, the world is that that there's not the Chinese it's not it was unbelievable <laughs> crazy time that 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 journey. Uh, okay, um, then I, I return the ball to, to Dora. Uh, Dora, is, uh, is your turn for Bettine. Thank you very much. Um, and Bettine, you already mentioned a little bit in your introduction um, the first time that you became fascinated with China when you traveled there for the first time. But you also mentioned then you decided quite a bit later to study Chinese, um, which is, I think, a quite intense fascination. Um, when when did that happen that you decided that you wanted to commit quite a significant uh, part of your life to studying China? Well, in 1996, uh, I wrote this book, uh, uh, Longing for Beijing. In, uh, it is also translated into Chinese. And I chose three of my important uh, training courses. And I wrote uh, in brief because it's not a very, you know, massive book. It's only thin book. But very delicate, and it's um, it, it gives a, a good insight of how the Chinese practice, and it's also well read in Ch in uh, the Netherlands and also in China. And so um, I was able to write this book, and I thought, well, if I make this triangle and always go back to this writing, China table tennis, then there I, I feel comfortable with, uh, with this. And I yeah, if you are interested, if you follow your passion, then uh, always something good will follow. So that's why I decided to go to, to study Chinese and uh, I was um, accepted at the university and I did that for two years. But unfortunately, I had to stop because uh, my husband, uh, my uh, my friend, he died. And at the same time, I was pregnant. Uh, so this was really difficult for me, of course, to combine study. I finished already my second year. 
uh, and we sh uh, should have gone to China with the baby. <laughs> uh, but uh, of course, that was uh, not re realistic anymore. So I stopped. But I, of course, the basic always stayed with me. And later, when I was traveling, or was when I was living in China for to be a correspondent, then I was benefiting from this basic Chinese uh, skills. And I also could develop by living there. Of course, you learn the most if you are in the midst of uh, the culture and the language and uh, everyday life. Uh, you hear everything this uh, every time this sounds, and then of course you learn the best. Thank you very much. Very good insight. Um, uh, and you mentioned already you moved to China, so I think Max has a few more questions about that. Uh, well, uh, um, yeah, you you had uh, um, the, these very different careers, uh, Bettine, a table tennis player and uh, writer, and uh, and uh, so much behind. Uh, after hearing you, uh, these uh, few things that you have mentioned now. So what uh, um, what uh, this is something that uh, um, I mean uh, you means uh, more to you. I mean, what, what, if you have to put uh, you know the, the your experience in uh, in uh, in uh, in balance, they are just uh, similar, or uh, the table tennis uh, uh, meant uh, more uh, comparing China is a complementing experience. Tell us a little bit more. Well, you know, if if I have to choose, what is your most precious for you, table tennis, now writing? Then, uh, of course, I uh, I choose table tennis because you know I think I will always be the table tennis player, and uh, no matter what I do, you know I can write a hundred books, but you know still the table tennis will prevail. It's like this, and uh, people people know me from this, and 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 they you know if, even if. If you ask people on the street, then it, they, from my age, they remember my matches, you know, in top 12, because that was always on the radio and the television, especially the radio, which was very uh, much uh, listened to back then. So, but I think they are complementary. And now, actually, uh, now I'm already almost 60 years. I've I turned uh, turned 60 this year. But the last years, I more and more, you know, uh, continue to be a coach, and I think. I I am surprised how, how how I like it. You know, I like to coach, and I, I like to be back in table tennis. And for instance, I work together with Mattia Sergier. You know him from Italy. Uh, yes, from Italy, and uh, uh, of course he is from uh, from Slovenia. But uh, you know, we work together sometimes, and it's real pleasure. You know, it's like coming home there in Treviso. It's uh, you know the people are very motivated, and uh, there is. Um, you know, respect among each other and also fun. And so that's nice. I really enjoy that. So, but I understand that if you coach, you have to coach for many years to have results, you know? It's not one year. <laughs> it, takes time. it takes time. Yes, definitely. So, but, uh, when uh, talking about table tennis, uh, 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 I mean, it's fascinating. We know very well. We are a table tennis people and we know uh, everything behind. But if you have to say something, Specific that you like, really like uh, the, in the table tennis. What what uh, would you say is the is the confrontation with the opponents? Uh, is your uh, performance? Uh, is the way you impose uh, the game? Uh, is uh, what what fascinating you the most uh, when uh, when uh, you are there and uh, uh, playing table tennis? Well, I think you know. It's uh, I always wonder. How would it be to play against myself? This question I have asked myself so many times. You know, <laughs> I'm sure you did that too. You know, because you don't know what kind of balls uh, you give to the opponent. But at the same time, you really must be able to know what kind of balls you give to the opponent and what it, how it affects your opponent. And 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 this game, you know, what do I give to you? What do you give me back? What is my answer? The game, you know, sometimes slightly changes, sometimes big changes. Uh, always adapt to every ball which comes and uh, make some creative decisions. And this game between the two, yeah, this is really uh, mesmerizing. You know, this is so fantastic, and it's like, uh, you know, addictive also. <laughs> very, very, very much. 
No, this this ability, I, uh, Dora, I keep uh, one more question for uh, Bettine before returning to you. Uh, so this uh, this ab ability, you know, to to consider very thoughtful table tennis uh, because uh, you are you are saying, and when you were player, uh, I, it was uh, tangible to see uh, what kind of uh, efforts uh, and uh, thoughts uh, you you put on the on the match, on the tactic, and so on. Uh, with the, with the experience in China, so how did this table tennis, uh, this background table tennis and experience and the personality helped you to you know to to spend that time in China? Was uh, was uh, connected or was the common denominator just table tennis China fascinating with China? So how the table tennis background uh, uh, helped you? When I, was working, uh, when I was working there as a journalist, you mean? That's yeah. What you mean? Yeah. Well, uh, indirectly, of course, I had many contacts uh, in China that helped me, you know, to get somewhere because, uh, you know, you must have the contacts in China. If you don't have network, it's impossible. So you have to build up this network. And in the beginning, of course, uh, I had my name, you know, this was in my pocket. So. And if I let people know, you know, I was uh, having a match point against Deng Xiaoping and even beating Cao Yaohua and Xi Baoxiang and Tong Ling. I was beating all these players, Yang Ying. And they really said, wow, how is that possible? Are you not from China and you beat them? That's, and then they were open to me. And so, and also, you know, it's uh, the, the, at the Chinese embassy and Dutch embassy, which you need very badly if you want to be a journalist in a, in a kind of country, it doesn't matter where. But especially in China, and if the people know you and your background, and then the doors go open. And and then the second is you for the first you must have the contact, and then you can have the interviews, and then you start to write. And especially for this Olympic Games, I had many contacts. I I interviewed all kinds of coaches and and officials, and even so I had a long talk with Zhuang Zedong, who has passed away unfortunately, because now. Of course, today we're talking, you know, in the months of the 50 years ping pong diplomacy. But I had the privilege to interview him and he was talking all the in and outs about, you know, his role in this ping pong diplomacy. And we did that at the Beijing Hotel and we were sitting to have tea for hours. You know, this is I never forget that this was such an experience. Yeah. So I don't know if audience noticed the the accent of uh, Bettine uh, naming the players, you know. Uh, so Fezan Sheshe, uh, Bettine, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, because sometimes you say Deng Yaping, but we heard the Yaping Deng, so something crazy, you know. So <laughs> you perfectly pronounce the name. You perfectly pronounce the name. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, then now, sorry, Dora, it's it's uh, all you. Thank you. Um, uh, I think it's very interesting to hear you two talk about table tennis. You know, I, I was tempted to just stay offline, but um, I do also want to ask you about uh, your books, Bettine, maybe moving a little bit away from the pure table tennis. So um, I think your most recent book is about Nobel Prize winner Pearl S. Uh, but what about her person inspired you? Uh, well, she, of course, uh, she was uh, um, living in China. She was raised in China, not slightly not born because when she was three months, she was taken um, with her parents who were missionaries back to China. They were on a furlough. And um, so she lived for 40 years. And uh, in the meantime, she was for four years back for study in uh in West Virginia, but but you know she was the one who spoke better Chinese than English, and um, you know collected like uh, combined uh, two cultures in one body. And um, when I was reading the last biography written by uh, an English uh, woman named Hilary Sperling, I was so fascinated that I thought I'm going to travel through the to the the, the points to the, to the houses and the cities and so on in China and in America where she lived. And this is for me like a, a, a starting point to write my book. So I take the reader um, into her life uh, along the places where she lived. And I um, and, uh, disclose her whole life and uh, the choices she had made because she had a real tough life. And I always like to read and hear stories about people who had uh, gone to, uh, through difficulties because, you know, if if you 
um, you know, have to don't have to compare yourself with other people. But sometimes you get inspired by people who, mm -hmm. you know, uh, get through some uh, so uh, so much hardship and still they prevailed and still they they tried to they uh, are were able to transform their lives just because of this hardship. And I think that's very interesting. So I learned from her choices. And I want to, the reader also to learn from this, how to cope with very diff, uh, difficult things that happen in your life. And she, for instance, lost four uh, brothers and sisters. She had a mentally disabled daughter, all these kinds of things. Uh, and when she went back, she was really not accepted in America as a Chinese woman. And a woman, what the status of woman in, in this time also was not the same like now, like it is now, although there's still a lot of things that, that has to improve for the, the position of women, in my opinion. Yes, I fully agree. <laughs> um, but yeah, very fascinating. No, I completely agree with your point on on hardships and reading about other people's lives, because it, it puts a lot of things in perspective, I think. Um, and you, you traveled to China and America and kind of followed uh, her footsteps, is that right? That's right. And I was, uh, you know, uh, on Internet, I was uh, I was finding a, a kind of a Pearl Buck footprint tour. And it was a kind of a travel group with all kinds of specialists uh, on Pearl Buck professors and all kinds of uh, people who knew a lot about her life. And so it was a privilege for me to travel in this group and uh, talk about this uh, experts. Uh, while we were traveling where she lived and we stood there and we talked about what happened especially on this spot in her life and this was really rich it was uh i could add that to my book and yeah this um i also you know they became friends as well and uh you know when i went to america there was a reunion and all from from all sides of america we we gathered you know in in the house from Pearl Buck in Green Hills Farm in Bucks County in Pennsylvania. Yeah. That sounds really great. That is really great. Um, so you, you went on to this tour, but with the book in mind, is that right? You didn't get. That's right. That's okay, right. Yeah. No, that's yeah. very cool. That's really cool. Um, and now moving a bit uh, away from this, I heard you also wrote a children's book, also about a little girl who plays table tennis and is fascinated right. with China. Yes, that's right. I was, um, you know, uh, asked by a museum, uh, the World wow. Academy, it's called, and they were organizing, uh, they were organizing um, an exhibition about the Ming Dynasty. You know, it, it, it's a very important um, era in in uh, Chinese history, and they had um, exhibits on on loan from a museum in Nanjing, and one of those items which were on loan was it was a statue of a golden cricket. And the story is about it that I wrote this story about the table tennis girl who was scouted in the in the province and event, eventually she ended up in the province in Nanjing in province team. And coincidentally, in reality, uh, close to the museum also in reality is the table tennis school of Nanjing. So this was, uh, you know, uh, I didn't know it, but it was coincidental. <laughs> I also was going to this museum to visit, you know, the museum to have a clear insight of where I was writing about. And the girl was, she was very talented and uh, she was the best in China, but she also wanted to develop in a different way. And she secretly uh, sneaked out of the training camp and she all the time wanted to go to the museum in her spare time. And she wanted, she always wanted to see uh, the cricket, the golden cricket. And she was really inspired by this. But uh, her teammates, they found it very strange because the teammates said, why? Why you not only play table tennis, but also interested in, in, in history and in, in, in like uh, in art? And how is it possible? That's very strange. So with, they were teasing her and bullying her. But still, you know, she eventually she came out as the stronger player. And she said, maybe they are jealous or they don't know how to cope with me. But I think it's really important to develop other sides in myself and read books and go to the museum that makes me a better player. And so it ended up like she was winning the Chinese championships and everybody was was happy for her. And, and especially the conservator of the museum, which who was supporting her, that she was not only playing table tennis, but also developing herself in another way. 
So he was cheering for her on like, uh, you know, he was among the spectators. So this was how the book ended. Yeah, it sounds lovely. And I can see a theme. <laughs> yeah. Other interesting yeah. yeah. table tennis yeah. makes you stronger. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, but I think we can maybe go back a little bit more towards table tennis, because I mean, I could talk about your books for yeah. many more minutes, but uh, I feel like Max might have something against yeah. that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dora. Yeah, but then you were mentioned before uh, uh, one of your uh, uh, recent trip uh, in uh, in uh, in Italy, uh, and I I met you there um, during yeah. the, the camp in Treviso with Matthias Sterzer, and um, I was really impressed uh, that uh, I was there for half an hour, but I think uh, I, I I got the the feeling the way. You 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 worked with the with the kids. They were admiring you. They were listening to you. They were like in, I don't know. I would say uh, in my way, as <laughs> as I used to say, in a, in a religious respect <laughs> on your. No, 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 no. On your, I think on your work. No, so, I think the, the question. So it was great. It was unbelievable. Great. Uh, the question is uh, how. What do you think is the key to uh, keep people uh, uh, engage uh, in uh, in um, in uh, yes in this case in this uh, training camp or uh, in in general in table tennis so what is the key to make them engaged well you know what you saw actually it was not my work it was matthias work you know matthias because okay. you know he is, uh, he is so fantastic with the boys you know he is like he is like a father for them, and and, the sp and at the same time he's really taking care of them, and he's warm, and he's, you know, uh, looking after them like it are his children, you know. And uh, so I came there, and he was introducing me, and uh, he was actually asking the respect for me. And okay. because when I am in Holland, uh, you know, I I have a different uh, opinion about how they approach me sometimes. So, you know, it's, it's respectful, but it's not like, you know, it's also a cultural thing. And also, you know, in which kind of culture you come. Because, you know, if he says she's coming and you have to listen to her, and is if he has the respect and as he has the authority, then, of course, it affects uh, my position also. So you have to combine, you have to work together in order to gain this kind of respect. That is my opinion. You know, if the uh, the one coach is not speaking in a respectful way about the other coach, then you you don't have a you know a basic for to working together. It's not possible. Yeah. I, so I definitely, yeah. I definitely agree. I mean, so it's a, it's a it's a mix of uh, you know uh, have a, a good authority, a good uh, uh, communication skill, a good, uh, uh, let's say, uh, charisma also, I would say. So it, it is a mix of uh, everything, uh, or do you think there is something that uh, a coach now, in this case, a coach should uh, should focus more? What, 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 what do you think on this? Well, you know, I was uh, able to work there for five hours a day. Sometimes in Holland, I only have two hours, so you have to do everything in these hours. It's also you have not uh, so much space to to experiment sometimes you have to experiment but i also do you, you know i think physical part and mental part and everything must be together you know technical part speaking also speaking about tactic what is your plan how do you want to play and and if you want to play this way how are you going to practice that strategy and so on and also we did some like resting you know in your because you know lately there was a kind of research I heard about there was a research done uh, before the Olympics in Lake Placid and they were making like research groups one group was practicing only physical for 75 and 25 mental and so on and they were seeing who had the which group had the most result and actually it turned out that the the, the group who practiced the most mentally so 75 percent mental and 25 uh, technical and physically uh, they uh, have the, had the best result. So, so I focus also on, okay, you finish practice, so you, you know, meditate a little bit, you know, so meditate is a big word, but, you know, go inside and think about what did you practice? Uh, what did you learn? What have, what do you have to work on? What do you take to the next lesson? 
and this kind of thing because you know table tennis is so quick 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 and even in china although it's not regarded like this and people say it's not true but i have seen it that sometimes like the parents also and the trainers say table tennis is so quick and boo, everything lots of impulses very quick and sometimes it's also good to do some slow qigong beside it you know because uh, to compensate the very you know your head is you know get a lot of impulses you know kind of how do you say um yeah impulses i think yeah yeah so, it is. It is. yeah it's uh yeah this is interesting because uh yes maybe um you said you know that that test uh, um revealed that the, the best performance was from those uh, uh working more on mentally actually if we think about uh, we we have some limitation for the body for the physical but we don't know any limitation for the mental so better yeah. to perform in a fresh body <laughs> yeah. Yeah, in, yeah, order, yeah. You know, in order to have the full uh, uh, potentials with the with the mental so i that's an in, in interesting interesting yeah, part no, yeah. No, thanks no, for uh, yeah i want to add something yeah also in when i was a journalist i went to the judo team and all kinds of teams wrestling team and what they do is they have all kinds of photos from opponents in the hall so when they have the uh, uh, confrontation with the opponent they have have done this confrontation so many times already in their head you know they and visualize some... in advance they visualize yeah. in advance yeah yeah so this this chinese you know in taoism also visualization is real important so you can practice at home see oh what is my back end even have an example maybe go to see the back end of uh, harimoto or whatever and the try on how can i do his uh, his version of my back and then see it in front of you and then practice it in your head and go to sleep and then next day you know because i think this visualization we puts you know too much uh, too less att attention to visualization i think it's a lot of um development we can you gain results from from this uh, aspect of training that's interesting yes definitely definitely interesting uh thanks very much bettine and uh, back to dora thank you max um Bettine, uh, I also heard that you played in the male league for a while while you were a player. Um, how was yeah. that experience? <laughs> yeah, I'm the only one. Uh, of course, a lot of women players, uh, uh, you know, after me, when I was 16 years, I first, you know, um, went to play in the men's league and first in the, not in the highest, but before the highest, and then Eredivisie, which is the highest uh, men's uh, league in, in Holland. Uh, so I, yeah, I did that for a few years, um, and I think it made me stronger because, of course, you know, every week I had a good, uh, good opposition and and good, oppo uh, yeah, good uh, battles, and I have to um, um, think about my game and uh, also uh, make good choices because if you know that men they play much stronger and a much more uh, nervous first ball even also in this uh, back in, the, in this time so I, I think it benefited me a lot to play against men but there was also a disadvantage of course because you know the men they uh, they don't play the rallies and they 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 still play in a different way like like women so you also have to play in the woman league i think uh, i think you have to always com combine the two things but i think if you don't have opposition in your own country you cannot be better player. You must be. You must have better players, opponents against you. They must yeah. challenge you. If you don't play too easy balls, because they punish you for this for these easy balls. If you don't have this, you know, then the problem comes in the important match, and you have to be prepared for that. Yes, I I understand. Um, mm -hmm. and and how was the reception of you <laughs> amongst the men? Were they welcoming or were they at first a bit weirded out? <laughs> yeah, of course, in the beginning it was a little bit strange. And also, you know, the television was there. You know, a lot of times the television came to re to record the matches because, the, of course, it was like uh, unique. And so the men didn't want, uh, you know, to lose against me. And they sometimes didn't know how to, uh, how to you know, uh, to behave. And there, it was difficult to find a good attitude. 
but you know after a few years uh, they got used to losing to me you know <laughs> so it was <laughs> no problem anymore and also i lost some matches of course also ah but you don't have to talk about some players who were the servers and they killed the ball after the servers it was not my game but still <laughs> from that yeah thank you very much um max over to you again uh, yeah, again, uh, well, table tennis is uh, is a dominating part, uh, but uh, uh, I just want to ask uh, Bettine, uh, comparing uh, your uh, your time and uh, now you also you got back to the to the international scene. Also, we met last year, 2019, in Ostrava for the youth uh, championships, uh, uh, European youth championship. What what do you think is the is the, the, the if you have to compare the the, 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 the that time and the, this time what what uh, what is the, uh, okay big changes were there uh, or where you can find some common denominator I mean the, the mental aspect I think is something that uh, uh, went throughout the the decades and decades so uh, just to have your opinion. To, to have a comparison of these two times of table tennis? Well, while I'm coaching with young players, I noticed that it's very hard for them to, to play with the concept, you know, and to stick to the tactics. And especially in these short games, it's really important to stick to your tactic because if you, uh, you know, derive from your tactic and, and do something else, which was not, you know, the, the task which the coach gave you, then you deliver two, three points, and it makes a big difference in a game which has only 11 points. So this is one, you know, because now the, the game is so fast, and, and they think, I, I bring the service into the game, and they see a lot of things, they copy a lot of things, and they, for instance, they get a good uh, a short service, and they say, oh, now I have to do the banana flip, but no idea wh why they do it. So uh, it's only fast, fast, fast. I not say everyone, eh? but uh, I, I noticed this, uh, especially in Holland. Uh, and what I see, you know, the game was more in depth uh, when, when we were playing. It's the ball was smaller and the ball could have a curve, you know, if you could have spin and it come from, uh, you know, under the edge and it could have a spin and it like could have a, a curve. And now it's much more one line. And you see also the players, they take everything above this edge and sometimes if you are not can cannot above the edge you have to do real try to re to do like before because sometimes they try to play hard under the edge but this is not working because the the boys have a different curve i think and uh, in my time also when you play against the chinese of course the service was really hard because when you have such a small ball in one milliseconds of course the rotation the frequency of the rotation is much bigger and much uh, frequently uh, more more rotation in one millisecond and so the service was sometimes in also even the spin you know the top spin you although the the record the rubber was so uh, so much lower back then then you still have to be careful that you don't block the ball over the table and of course now also you know it's like also everything is relative if somebody can play a good spin now and the other one is only playing fast then the one who's playing a little spin has still a good spin uh, if you don't if you uh, understand what i mean but the yeah. difference in the spin were much diff were, were, were much more uh, different like now and also these 21 points yeah it was it's much different yeah. than yeah. 11 yeah, yeah. yeah. So then that means that the, the speed, uh, you know, the increasing the speed of the ball, the anticipation uh, is uh, is uh, is related also to to have a, a better uh, um, physical condition because now now we see you know you have to be really really fit because otherwise yeah. even the the game is short but uh, nevertheless you have to have so you you think is is uh, there is a very correlation. I think we were also very fit back then. Really. Yeah, we're, yeah, yeah. And sometimes I think the ladies can be a little bit more, sometimes a little bit more fit. <laughs> yeah, the man is different story. I think. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I mean, it's I understand what you mean, and I agree with you. But uh, it's like a different kind of physique. We, you know, we had we had to play like uh, eleven matches, best of uh, five until twenty-one. 
and and so you have to endure you know so it's a different kind of being fit uh so yeah it's it's, it's different yeah. Um, good. So we are getting uh, quite uh, uh, quite well. We are receiving some questions. So I would invite uh, the the audience also to um, to to drop their questions. Dora, I'll return the the ball to your uh, to your end and uh, your time. Thank you. Um, yes, we've had a few questions. Um, the first one from Eva Yele. Uh, are any of your books translated into other languages? Uh, she was specifically asking about German and English, um, yeah. but I know they've been translated into Chinese. Uh, and yeah, Italian, 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 also maybe Italian, no, please. No, not Italian. No, but in German. My previous books, uh, Daughters of Mulan, uh, which is about the position of women in China, I made a kind of uh, research about the position of women. I interviewed a lot of women and put it in a historical per perspective. Uh, uh, perspective. Uh, and this is it translated into German. And you can, uh, if you have Google Books, you can, or uh, uh, Apple Books, you can download it. Perfect. Tuchter, Thank you very much. Tuchter of Mulan. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. Can I, can, I take one, can I take one question also from uh, Eva Yeller again that uh, uh, we say hi Eva, uh, uh, I think it's quite late in Australia and down under, so hi Eva. Uh, we have a... Um, nice one you, Eva. Nice to hear you, Eva. Nice huh? to see you. Nice to see uh, <laughs> <hear> you. <laughs> yes. Why there is not uh, other player like Bettine uh, uh, Frizikop in Holland anymore? So what is uh, the reason? Okay, recently we have seen the Britterland uh, yeah, yeah, making yeah, the, doing quite yeah. well uh, at the moment. The qualification yeah. for the Olympics. Yeah. But so, it's you know like uh, in Holland, it's uh, you know it depends from one person who put a lot of effort herself. You know who uh, takes her or uh, his own path, and uh, you know the the association has not a structure. Uh, has not proved uh, to have this structure and the knowledge or whatever to to produce uh, more good players. It's just like it is. And if you uh, stick to your your uh, same uh, uh, concept, if you t are continuing to do the same thing, then you get the same result. You know, everyone knows that. So I think there must be something different. And I, in my opinion, there must be a kind of uh, uh, combination between coaches who has experienced themselves as a player and maybe also some players uh, some coaches who has a uh, different skills uh, and and they must um, yeah uh, work together you know if, because everyone has uh, good points and weak points uh, yeah so I think uh, for instance one is a good coach one is a good condition trainer uh, physical trainer uh, the one is good in tactics. Uh, the the other is maybe uh, um, in a you know pedagogically. How do you say? Um, um, yeah, this kind of things you have to combine, and 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 this is never done in the Netherlands. You know, it's like um, always the same concept and um, not practicing enough, not working together enough. But you know, there was a time like in 1992 we had good results in men competition in um, women competition this was a good time and sometimes there is one player but uh, th this one player must be able to be a role model and um, uh, and motivate other players and uh, you know be able to 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 go to to work together and you know for instance in one team and then you have the opportunity to be in the team and to learn from the good player but also, you know, uh, sorry to say that that is like in Europe, of course, so many Chinese players has, uh, have added up to the national teams that some people from the from the national teams has lost hope. And I think uh, Germany has done that in a better way because they have always said only one, a maximum two, but there must always be one or two uh, German and, and also the Chinese players. They must, uh, you know, they must um, uh, also like be of value of of the the people from from the original country you know so i think this is 
done not in a proper way. So many players from a younger generation, they lost connection. This is my opinion. And of course, you can you can um, uh, improve your level together with the Chinese newcomers. That's no problem. But for for instance, in our team, it's you know it has been dominated by two Chinese players, and of course they had value and they were very good uh, players. And if they were not there, we didn't have any result. But still, if you have a upside, you have also a downside, and you must always look to the downside downside also to improve yourself. And we have done that not enough. That's my opinion. Yeah, well, that's that is very true. I mean, uh, we have been through this uh, the, the the huge quantity of Chinese uh, playing uh, national teams uh, across the Europe, uh, and uh, it's interesting topic. I have to say that <laughs> maybe yeah. we can we can, yeah, uh, we can you, know, but, uh, you must always you know turn around the problem. You know, Chinese national team would never ever allow any foreigner <laughs> to the national teams and so you must set boundaries for this you can yeah. allow but you must really set boundaries i guess yeah. i think setting boundaries is really important very very good answer i would say and um dora i think we we still have something else so dora back to you yes so um Actually, we have a question from our colleague, Yasna Rather. Hi, Yasna. Hello. Yasna. And she was very impressed with uh, your focus and your discipline uh, throughout your career. So she was asking, did you always have the same approach? Um, and what could athletes do to have such a perfect attitude towards training? Wow. Uh, for me, this is difficult to explain because for me, it's normal. <laughs> You know, I've never done in a different way, and um, you know, I'm I'm just like this. You know, uh, I cannot give an advice. I think. I mean, I was really passionate uh, uh, from table tennis, and and I have always had the same attitude. And also, I, I of course I had my uh, difficult periods that I was not motivated and I was tired. I think you always must rest good because that's what I think. What was my strong point was that. You know, as soon as my game was finished, I went to my hotel and slept. I was resting uh, in a very good way because if you are practicing hard and you get tired, then you are mentally you you know you lose uh, you you lose strength. Um, so I think resting is on also underestimated uh, topic. And it doesn't mean that now, sometimes nowadays in Europe, you see, oh, we practice two hours and not more because it's not effective anymore. But what about the Chinese? They practice eight hours still, you know, but uh, as soon as they, they go out of the hall, they go to rest and no other kind of parties or whatever. They they practice or they rest. And, and it's not like, oh, we practice, but the rest of the day we are going to party and we're going to do the social media and all kinds of. Uh, very uh, tiresome activities. Uh, that's an excuse not to practice that you know that much. I think, in my opinion, because if you want to add up with uh, to catch up with China and and, and Asia, I think uh, Europe has to practice still seven eight hours a day. Because if I talk with Marie Rachova and my colleagues from Hungary, uh, Susa Ola, who I met last year, she said, "Well, Bettina, we practice eight hours a day. It was normal for us, and of course." A lot of players still practice a lot, but for then, if you want to be European top, this was kind of normal. Yeah, but now they say, uh, okay, but this is not like if you practice so much, it's you, you know, it's not effective anymore. You must, you must not practice anymore because I'm tired or whatever, or maybe injured or. Of course, if you're injured, you have don't have to practice. You have to um, go to the physiotherapist, but. You understand what I mean? Maybe I'm a little bit strict, but I think if the Chinese and the Japanese practice eight hours a day, and if Europe say no, four hours is enough, and you still lose, then you have to ask yourself, do we practice enough? Because they practice eight hours a day and still are the best. So for me, it's simple. So you have to be very disciplined and focused to keep your discipline and focus. <laughs> yes. <exactly. laughs> Makes perfect sense. It really does. There's no Good. other way of saying it. 
Thank you very much. So I, think, uh, I think we have uh, uh, Eva is uh, is with us. Uh, it would be I don't know uh, Eva. Uh, are you there? Maybe here we go. Is she she's there? No, it's not there. Eva. Hi, nice. hey, hello, hello, Emma. Good evening. Hi, nice to see you. But I don't hear you. <laughs> yeah, because she's uh, far away. She's in Australia, you yes, know. So. It takes sometimes, uh, you know, the the, the voice yes. to to reach. So yeah. Yes, I understand. <laughs> not not working. Some uh, some uh, some connection problem. Some technical problem. But we can uh, we can see you and. Uh, maybe uh, you know, get a question, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> So oh, I think, uh, uh, Dora, I have actually one more question for uh, for Bettine. Maybe by the time uh, Eva can uh, can uh, uh, reconnect again. So we were talking about uh, uh, this is the very last question. Uh, we we're talking about the past, uh, the, the your time in China, the table tennis. Uh, so what, what is the Bettine current and future career? <laughs> now, well, I'm all, all for 60 years, you know. I still well, there is, there yeah, yeah. is time. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, actually, uh, I think table tennis is uh, the 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 years I'm uh, I want to still to want to work, and I still have lots of energy. I feel uh, knock on wood, uh, still very fit, uh, feel very fit. So, I actually my passion is is table tennis and I'm in, in uh, you know my intention is to work more and more in table tennis and do whatever I can you know to uh, to help people uh, to uh, to raise their uh, level and um, uh, yeah that's what I think <laughs> and I, I don't know in what way but I, I do it in Holland and sometimes in Italy and it's my plan also to organize uh, um, combination between um, training, table tennis training, and language um, courses in China. I have connection with uh, language school, a uh, Dutch language school in in Shanghai, and we are trying uh, to see if we can organize these kind of camps. You know, because uh, I think when people, when young people are able to to go there and see um, the, how the Chinese practice and learn something about the culture and the language. It is a, an experience they will never ever forget in their life, and I, I really, um, yeah, want for everyone, you know, to have this experience. So I want to make this possible for people who are interested. So this is also a plan I want to do. Well, will be great to see you around the tables and the table tennis centers and so on. So uh, it would be great, and I hope. The, the very best for you. I don't know if we have uh, still have Eva uh, uh, here with us. So uh, maybe just a very quick interaction with uh, with Eva. Eva Eva Yeller uh, is, uh, is, uh, is 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 our special guest, uh, last minute guest. We <laughs> I would say after a long, super long and successful career in uh, in Germany. Talking about the future, Eva Yeller just recently moved to Australia to start a new challenge as a coach. And judging by the, the Facebook post and the movement of the young players in Australia, I think she's already successful in Australia as well. So I don't know if Eva, you're here maybe to, to say a few words to Bettine. Are you there? She's not there. <laughs> yeah. okay. Okay. But I, okay. I, I know what one of her questions would be, Bettine. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so maybe it will just be her voice for now. I'm sorry. 
um, uh, you're also quite successful in other sports. You were, you have many interests, as we've established, but also uh, you, you were doing some other sports as well. No, I've heard something about cycling, skating. No, no, no. no, no. I, I'm not well, good at uh, any other sports than only table tennis. <laughs> yeah, maybe okay. tennis, but no. I've not, I'm, I've not tried other sports, like so to say. I, I play tennis sometimes, and I I am I keep myself fit with all kinds of things, but I didn't try to to be uh, you know to improve my skills in any other sports. No, no. So not not no. skating, not skating anymore. No. I mean, everyone no. can skate a little in China, <laughs> in uh, the Netherlands, but no, it's not. <laughs> Okay, so, Dora, so just writing on table tennis and China and all these things, that's not really a lot, yes. no. That's yes, no, it's not really <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I keep myself that was a joke. Yeah. <laughs> so, Dora, it's time to, to close this uh, interaction with uh, with uh, Bettine Frisico and uh, I just want to leave to you, Dora, a few uh, to conclude this session. So back to you again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Bettine. Thank you, Eva, even though we couldn't hear you. Um, <laughs> uh, th thank you for being here. It was really interesting. I would have loved to talk way more about your books, but then I got overruled by table tennis. Um, maybe we can do this again sometime. <laughs> yeah. Maybe after your next book. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much for being here and also thank you to our audience for uh, joining us as always. Um, our next webinar is again on Wednesday next week, two o'clock Central European Summer Time. Um, we will be talking about best practices uh, of table tennis training centers and we will be joined uh, by representatives from Düsseldorf and Ochsenhausen in Germany. Uh, so please come back for that. Um, again, thank you Bettine. Yeah, thanks for having me, Massimo and Dora. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure and uh, uh, wish you lots of success, uh, especially during these difficult times, you know, to be able to to do your work uh, in an alternative way and hopefully we see each other soon and uh, all the best. And also, Thank Eva, you. good luck Very in Australia much. and uh, uh, see you soon. <laughs> Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you so much, Bettine. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.